Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to begin at verse number 4 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to begin to look at verse number 4 through 11. And then we're going to jump down to verse 29. Verse 29. So we're going to read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at verse number 4 through 11. And then we're going to jump down to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 again, but verse 29 through 31. All right? You got it? If you're here, you don't have a Bible, please don't feel any type of way. We got all of it on the screen right here behind me. These screens are not just for show. We put these screens up so that you can say the lyrics to the song, so you can read along with the scripture, verify what we're saying, and uh, all that good stuff, and be able to take some notes and some pictures. All right. You ready? It says, "These there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still to another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He distributes them to each one as he has determined. Now let's jump down to verse number 29. It says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, now eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. Now eagerly desire the greater gifts, and I will show you the most excellent way. The title of my message today is, I Got You a Gift. I Got You a Gift. Do me a favor, look at the person next to you and say, I Got You a Gift. Now look at that person who said that, say, give it to me then, give it to me. What is it? What'd you get me? Let's just, don't lie in church, don't lie in church, don't lie in church. Somebody clap, like, here it is, right here. <laughs> Good job, <laughs> Spirit of Petty, we just rebuke it right now. Father, I just thank you so much for all that you're getting ready to do in this place. I pray you blow our minds with your word. We need a word from you that would just take us to the next dimension, next level, next season of our life. Captivate our hearts. I pray, God, that it's not just me, but it's you speaking. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say. Everybody say. I got you a gift. Uh, this week, there was... Something that's been going viral on social media. And uh, I wanted to take a moment just to address it just for a mini second. And now if you're not on social media, I'll catch you up to what's happening. Uh, there was this young lady who was on a date <laughs> with this gentleman. And uh, the gentleman pulls up to a cheesecake factory. When he pulls up to the Cheesecake Factory, uh, the young lady said, I'm not getting out of this car. And he said, why don't you get out of this car? She said, because I'm better than this. You ain't going to take me to no Cheesecake Factory. You better step your game up. And so it created all of this turmoil and tension on social media to the point where now there's this list of places that women are saying you can't take them to on a first date. Obviously, Cheesecake Factory is on there, and they say you can't take me to Starbucks, and uh, Chipotle, don't do that. They say Applebee's is out. They say Buffalo Wild Wings, you better Buffalo Wild somewhere else, but you're not going to Buffalo Wild here. And uh, they said Olive Garden, don't do it. Don't take me on a date to no Olive Garden. I hop out of question. You better hop somewhere, because I'm not hopping in that <laughs> store with no pancakes. And uh, they said ice cream shops, totally out of question, can't do that. And then, y'all, they said church. If you're here right now on a date, <laughs> just want to welcome you to Union Church. Welcome to our church. 
Bless you, brother. Thank you for bringing her today. But if you did bring her to church, <laughs> you better be serious about it. Cause <laughs> so I was looking at this list, and I was thinking, hey, you know what? I think I'm going to make my own list. And so I made a list for men. And on my list, I made a list of the gifts that women need to stop giving to men because we no longer want it. <laughs> on my list, I put ties. Stop it. We don't want no more ties. Don't buy no more ties. We don't wear them. We don't need them. Stop buying us socks. We, we, don't. I don't care. Look, it's a designer's sock. No, it's not. It's not. It's not. There's nothing designer about the sock. I don't need it. No, I don't need the sock. Uh, you know, cologne. It's 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 got to be above a certain price. That 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 low low cologne, watered down that you got from the cart somewhere. Some we don't want that. We want Louis. We want Louis. We want some Louis. Okay, gym memberships. Cut it out. Stop. Don't. Stop getting us gym memberships. We don't want it. Exercise equipment. Stop. Uh, I, we, framed photos of you and our kids. Stop. We don't. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> it's us. Look. Oh, hey. Hey, yeah, thank you. Another picture. We don't need it. Gift cards to restaurants we don't like. Can you stop it? Just because you was in the line in Target, you forgot to get us a gift. You looked to the left, and you saw a gift card, and you just grabbed the first thing you saw. We do not like Jimmy John's that much. Let's cut it out. Stop. Uh, uh, what I'm saying to you is that gifts are important. T today, in today's passage, when we see the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Paul is talking about gifts. When we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he's talking about how God gives out these gifts and how these gifts are useful to the church and how these gifts are important for the church and how these gifts are important to your life. Why is Paul writing to Corinth? He is writing to Corinthians because they are in a city called Corinth, and this is the church of Corinth. And so he's writing to this church, and as he's writing to this church, he is trying to get some things in order at this church. Because he built this church, and then as he traveled to build other churches, he started getting wind about chaos happening within this church. There was division amongst this church. There were people in the church saying, I'm down with Paul. Another person saying, I'm down with Apollos. I'm down with this apostle. I'm down with that apostle. He started hearing about all kind of crazy type of sexual situations they were in, sleeping with prostitutes and, and, and sacrificing themselves to idols and, and hooking up with all kinds of people. And he started hearing about the food that they were eating and uh, foods that were being sacrificed to gods and foods that was at this temple. And So Paul's like, let me write a letter. I'm sick of this church. Paul is, is writing a letter, and he's trying to get this church together. He's trying to get this church in order. That's what this series has been about. If you're here for the first time, and you're like, man, why would you title a series called I'm Sick of This Church? I know some, so many people hit me up and said, Pastor, that can't be the real title of this series. And I said it is, because at the end of the day, I do believe that there is a kind of church that God is looking for. That there is a kind of church that the Lord wants to see. And that there is a church that can turn God's heart. We looked at in week one at the church of Laodicea. That he kind of, he said, you were lukewarm. You weren't on target. I spit you out my mouth. Because that church made him sick when he tasted the lukewarmness of the church. Last week we started talking about the church of Ephesus. Where he says, hey, I love y'all. But uh, you guys, are, are you forgot your first love. You forgot why you're here and what you're called to do. And now we see Paul here talking to the church of Corinth saying, come on, let's bring ourselves together. And what we have decided is every church has got to be clear on what the purpose of that church is. And you got to be disciplined to make sure you don't move off that purpose. At Union Church, we have concretized our call. We have determined who we are to be. And we have said we do four things here at this church. Number one, our main mission is to unite people with purpose. 
When we unite you to purpose, it means there's a purpose on your life. There's something that God's called you to do. There's a destiny that he has for you. And our goal is to get you to that destiny as fast and as soon as you possibly can. Because I don't want you to stumble into heaven. I don't want you to just barely make it in. I don't want you to just meet God on your deathbed. I want you to have abundant life on this earth. I want you to be victorious in every area. I want you to experience what Christ can feel like when he is in a life that surrendered to him. How do we get people on that journey? Put that back up. It's four things. We get people to know God. We get people to find freedom. We get people to discover purpose and make a difference. This is Union Church. This is what we do. Everything we do in this church goes back to this. Even to the point of people asking me, so they say, Pastor, can we do this at the hub? And can we do this at the hub? Do you know when I'm making a decision about what we can and cannot do at the hub, I'm making a decision based on this? Does it help people know God? Will it help anybody find freedom? Will it help anybody discover purpose? Does it help anybody make a difference? When people say, Pastor, the church should be doing this and the church should be doing that, before I just say yes to everything church should be doing, because, you know, everybody got an idea of what church should be doing. I got to stop and say, wait a minute, all right, sounds so good, sounds wonderful, but I got to go back to who God called us to be. I'm not talking about every church, I'm talking about us. He said, hey, does it help people know God? I don't know. Does it help people find freedom? Does it help people discover purpose? Does it help people make a difference to the point where I end up saying no to stuff? Because when you're truly on target, you not only know what to say yes to, you know what to say no to. And we've decided, nope, it's not going to get us to where we need to be. This is where we are. So first week, I dealt with no God. Second week, I dealt with find freedom. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about what it means to discover purpose, to discover purpose. At Union Church, we want everyone to discover your purpose. We believe that God has a unique and distinct purpose for your life. Everybody watch this, front, back. He has designed you specifically for the calling he has put on your life. Let me say it again. He has designed you specifically for the calling he has put on your life, which means stop questioning your existence. You short for a reason. You tall for a reason. You dark for a reason. You light for a reason. You got a lot of hair for a reason. You got no hair for a reason. You got a loud voice for a reason. You got a low voice for a reason. You are a male for a reason. You are a female for a reason. God has designed you specifically for a reason. And rather than wrestling with the reason he designed you, tap in to why he created you that way. Because maybe there's a greater purpose on your head than you know. And what you think might be an upgrade could really be a downgrade from what God is actually trying to do in your life. We, we, we want you to discover your purpose. We believe that our loving creator invites each of us to experience the joyous adventure of fulfilling the potential he has placed on the inside of us. Can I tell you a problem? Here's one of the problems. Most people do not discover their purpose. Most people in church have yet to come to grips with the purpose that God has on their life. Most people never discover a direction that draws on all their gifts, talents, abilities, and passions. So guess what you do? Guess what you do? And I'm saying you, but it's really us because I'm included. So we go from place to place. We go from job to job. We go from relationship to relationship. We go from church to church because we have yet to tap into the purpose that God has for our lives. What this is called is being aimless. Most people live in aimlessness. You have no target. You got no direction. You got no focus about you. You, wherever the wind blows, that's where you go. Wherever life brings you, you just adjust and go that way. Instead of saying, nope, I know who God called me to be. I know what God called me to do. I know who I am in him. I'm not just going everywhere, following every trend. Nope. I am planted. I, I'm planted by God, and I have a target, and I am not aimless. This is my problem with that list. 
My problem with that list is that you are suggesting that the quality of a restaurant will dictate the quality of a person that you're dating. Where the reality of it is, is you can be eating steak with someone who's aimless, but you can be at Applebee's with someone who has direction and is on a budget. So you gotta be careful not to be fooled by steak that you make a mistake about your life. But you got to get to a place and say, hey, this might be coffee, but I'm in covenant with somebody because this person got direction. They're committed. They know where they're going. They know what they're doing. But all it takes, see, that's the devil right there. All it takes is a nice restaurant to talk to. So, 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 so Boo Boo the Fool can pick you up in a nice ride, bring you to a nice restaurant, be crazy, lost, just just jacked up, tore up from the floor. But because we sit down nice and it's nice music, this is a good day. No, I'm trying to figure out, do you know your purpose? I'm trying to figure out, do you know where you're going? I don't really care if we go to, we go to Starbucks, Five Guys. I don't care where we meet. What I'm trying to figure out is not the quality of the food. I'm trying to figure out the quality of the food that's sitting in front of me right now. Do you know where you're going? And so the devil's trying to play you with nice dates and nice restaurants and a nice rental. I rented this car to pick you up because I knew this is what you was looking for. Meanwhile, it was really the enemy trying to distract you and fool you. But yet you got a king sitting in Applebee's on a budget waiting for you to show up. But I can't show up there because that's beneath me. No, 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 no. Push the neighbors and get in purpose. You are looking for... Purpose. You are trying to figure out who God has called me to be. And so here at Union Church, my prayer is that you discover your purpose. You know why this is important to me? Because we're in this series about church. And uh, I've been in church my whole life. And I'm, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm past goosebumps. I, I'm past, uh, ooh, that was great. I'm past, we had a time. Well, what, what'd y'all do? I don't know. It, was just, it just felt good when we were in there. <laughs> How was the preaching? Preaching was phenomenal. What did he say? I don't know. <laughs> what was the scripture he read? I don't know. What was the title? I don't know. But man, it was, we was in there. Just, oh, okay, I, I'm, I'm past that. At this point, I need transformation. At this point, teach my mind. At this point, I don't want to just, I don't want you to go to church and just get a high. We, 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 we get a spiritual high, and we leave feeling good, but having no substance, no change, no transformation. I'm at a space where I'm saying, hey, God, I got to get to a place where I don't want you just to go to church and not no purpose. Because you can have all the services in the world and still not know why you're created. You can have all the services in the world and still not know why you're supposed to be here on earth. So here's what I want to give you. I want to give you three keys on the road to purpose. I want to give you three keys on the road to purpose. Take some notes and uh, let's write this down. The first key is you got to discover your gifts. Write that down. You got to discover your gifts. You should be trying to figure out what your gifts are. Every person in this room, you should be thinking, what are my gifts? I'm not asking about about your height and how good you look. See, you're spending so much time trying to figure out how you look and do I look good, but what are my gifts? Because everybody has a gift. I don't care how you were raised. I don't care what gender. I don't care what your social status. I don't care what neighborhood you were raised in. Everybody's got a gift. Pastor, what do you mean by gift? A gift is a divine empowerment or enablement used to edify the church. It is a favor which one receives without any merit of his own. It is something that you do that brings fulfillment and makes a difference in the lives of those around you. Keep that up. It's a divine empowerment, a divine enablement. This is something that just God just gave me. I don't even know how I sing like this. I don't know how I can organize stuff like this. I don't even know how I cook like this. I don't even know how I think like this. I don't even know how I get people in shape the way I do. I don't know how I can do math the way I do math. I don't know how science just comes so easy to me. I don't know how writing is just something that I do. It's a divine empowerment or enablement. 
It is literally a favor that one receives without merit. Some of these gifts you were just born with. You didn't have to work that hard to get it. It just fell in your lap. It just comes to you. It's a natural part of who you are. It is something that brings you fulfillment and makes a difference in the lives of those around you. God wants you to tap into your gift because I'm telling you when you tap into your gift, it will change everything. They tell the story, you've heard it before, of the nine-year-old boy who was born blind. And he's sitting in a classroom. And as he's sitting in that classroom, uh, uh, there's a mouse that ends up in the classroom. And the teacher tells the whole class to be quiet, calls on the nine-year-old boy, and tells the nine-year-old boy, can you find the mouse? When everybody quieted down, the nine-year-old boy who was born blind ends up hearing because he had such a great heightened sense of hearing that he heard exactly where the mouse was, found the mouse, and that day they called him Stevie the Boy Wonder. And now Stevie Wonder, as we know him, has won over 25 Grammys, sold over 70 million albums. Why? Because what he thought was a deficiency of being born blind. He had somebody tap into his gift of hearing. And the day he tapped into the gift of hearing, he started to accelerate in that gift. What I'm telling you is many of you, you look at your deficiencies and what's wrong with you and what I don't have going for me and what I'm missing and what I'm lacking. But where is that unique gift that God has given you. Pastor, what do I got to do to find my gift? Well, first of all, here in Union Church, if you go to Growth Track Step 2, we actually help you find your gift. Growth Track Step 2. Pastor, when do you do Growth Track Step 2? We do Growth Track Step 2 every second Sunday of every month. Every second Sunday of every month, you can go to Growth Track Step 2, and we can tap you into your purpose. But uh, I wrote down seven questions that you should be asking yourself as you're searching and seeking out what your gifts are. Seven questions. Seven questions. You can write them down, take a picture of it, but you should be asking, what do I love to do? Man, what do I enjoy doing? Because your gift is going to be connected to something that you love. What do I do the best with the greatest amount of ease? It takes other people a long time to figure this out. But for some reason, for me, it just clicks right away. What would everyone around me say my gift is? If you say you can sing, but nobody else ever said that? <laughs> like nobody else ever said that? Oh, yeah, I can sing. I can, I can sing, sing. Who else? Who else verified that? Who else said that was good? If it was just you, I don't know if that's your gift. What activities make me lose track of time? When you're in your gift, man, time just rolls. They have to give me a clock because I'm in my gift. If I don't get a clock, I will talk all day. I will just go. I got so much to say. I'm, and hear me, if they gave me more time, I just have more stuff to say. I never run out of stuff to say. I got more stuff to give you than I have time to give it to you, but that's because I'm in my gift. I lose track of time, right? What do people compliment me on frequently? What do I do that has the favor of God on it? There's some stuff you do that just got favor on it. When you do it, it's like an acceleration, a, a momentum. There's just like a God oil on it. There's just an anointing on it. There's just this God thing that happens when you do that. I, I love this. We ask everybody this question who joined our dream team. Uh, we ask if you had all the money in the world, all the time in the world, all the resources in the world, and you could do something for God, what would it be? As you start answering these questions, and I'm asking you to take time this week to answer these questions, you're going to start to tap into what is my gift. Please hear me. When you tap into your gift, you are going to experience a level of fulfillment, peace, success, and freedom that you have never had before. Which means that if I spend too much time not operating in my gifts, life can get pretty miserable. And you start living, if you start living your entire life, if you work a job without working your gifts at that job, then you're going to be bitter, you're going to be miserable, you're going to be frustrated, you're going, and what's going to end up happening is you will overdose on things to occupy your time. So because you're not in purpose, because you're not operating in your gifts, now you overdose on gossip. 
you, you overdose on going out. You go out so much because you, you, cause, cause you're not on purpose. So to make yourself feel better about a life that's ineffective, you got to always be in the club and be partying and be out because you're not fulfilled because you're not operating in your gifts. You will overdose on things that are bad for you when you are not locked into your purpose. You will overdose on TikTok and overdose on Instagram. Most people sin not because they're bad, but because they're bored. For many of you, being bad is not your problem. It's you got bored and life is so boring to you. Because you don't have a life where you're operating in your gifts. So now you get tempted more easily to do foolish stuff because you don't have anything exciting to bear off from the stuff that's, that you shouldn't be doing. And you got to get to a place and get to a space where you recognize, hey, I got to operate my gifts. Hear me, if you do not operate in your gifts, what will also happen is you'll covet someone else's. And we live in a day where everybody's trying to covet someone else's gift. It's not just you. I go through this. Every time I preach, I try to be my most authentic self. Every time I preach, I try to be my, I'm me. This is me. Like it or luck, this is me. This is, this is who I am. But, but I still, I go on YouTube. And sometimes I see a preacher, and he's sitting down in a chair, and he's just killing people just from a chair. And I say, man, I got to get me a chair one day and just <laughs> sit down. And when I see a preacher with a TV behind him, and he just taps the TV, and the TV go, I start thinking, man, maybe I need to just tap a TV. You know, come on now. I watch Bishop Jakes. <laughs> Don't nobody make you feel insecure as a preacher. Like watching Bishop Jakes. And by the time he's done pontif pontificating and going into the word, I'd be sitting there saying, I'm not preaching no more. I'm tired of it. But, 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 but here's what 1 Corinthians 12 says. 1 Corinthians 12 says, now if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but there's just one part body. Hear me. Your gifts are special. Your gifts are unique. We need every single one. We got to stop getting to this place where everybody think, as long as I got a microphone, that's a gift. This is not the only gift. You have an administrative gift. You have a helping gift. You have whatever gift that God has given you. You got to discover what that gift is. I'm going to get myself in some trouble, and uh, I'm going to say something that's very embarrassing. This is like a, if you got money, you probably don't know what I'm about to talk about. But if you ever was broke, you, you, you might understand this. Um, years and years and years ago, long time ago, I was filing my taxes. And I had a relative who told me I could claim their kids. <laughs> On my taxes. Anybody ever, anybody... Anybody ever heard of this? Anybody ever heard of this? Have you ever heard of it? Are you sitting there like, what? People do this? <laughs> is it just me? No, I'm serious. Anybody ever heard of this? Or is this a unique thing to me? You know people. You not people, but you know people. Yeah, I had a relative say, hey, claim my kids on your taxes. Because if you claim my kids on your taxes, it, I'm, I'm not going to claim them. Because I got 10 of these men. You, you did take two of them. <laughs> and so I did it. Did my taxes. You know, it's a turbo tax. Did my taxes. And I claimed this relative's kids on my taxes because they told me it was going to be all right. And boy, I got a lot of money. Oh, man. I did not know. At that time, I had no kids. I did not know kids. Could get you a tax return. 
I never seen this amount of numbers. I never seen, oh my Lord, wow. I better have me some kids so I can get some of this. And so I got the money for claiming my relative kids. But one day, that's something called an audit. And I got audited it in it. By the IRS. Who said you ain't got no kids? These are not your kids. And all the money that they gave me, they wanted it back with interest. It took me five years. This is true. To pay back because I claimed something that wasn't mine. And many of you have claimed someone else's gift. And you've seen a little boost in your life. But what you don't know is that the years you are spending claiming someone else's gift, you have ignored your own. And I am telling you that God's not getting ready to bless who you pretend to be. God is getting ready to bless the authentic, real you. So you can try to keep keeping up with everybody else. Or you can say, God, I want what's mine and what you call me to do for my life. Push your neighbor say, don't claim nobody else's kids. Don't, don't do that. Pastor's preaching today. Pastor's preaching today. Come on. Everybody just open your hands. I rebuke the spirit of comparison off your life. And I declare in the name of Jesus, you're not going to compare yourself to your neighbor. You're not going to compare yourself to the woman down the street. You're not going to compare yourself to that husband over there. I break and bind the spirit of comparison off your life. You're going to look at your gifts like you've never seen your gifts before. God is anointing you for such a time as this. And there are gifts that he is releasing onto your life. And those gifts are getting ready to come to the forefront in your life. Say, I receive it in Jesus' name. Come on, say, I receive it in Jesus' name. Second thing you got to do is, once you discover your gifts, now you got to develop your gifts. Once you find your gift, develop it. Work on it. Study about it. Research it. Practice with it. They say it takes 10,000 hours to become a master at a gift. Hear me, it takes time to develop your gift. It takes training to develop your gift. And most people do not develop their gifts because of something called instant gratification. Instant gratification means if it don't pay me now, I ain't doing it. If it don't make me famous right away, I'm not doing it. If it don't blow me up, if it don't put me in the forefront, if it don't get me more followers, if it don't make me rich next week, then I'm not doing it. And so what's happening is because you're not planted in your gift and developing your gifts, you never spend enough time to become an expert at it. And so now you are all over the place. You a rapper on Monday. You a doctor on Tuesday. You an influencer on Wednesday. You're trying to be a scientist on Thursday. Friday, you're going back to school for liberal arts, which means absolutely nothing. But you're just going. Just get a liberal arts degree because liberal arts just means whatever. It means the arts are liberal. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> what I'm saying to you is that you got to say, no, I'm going to work my gift. Hear me, I'm not asking you to quit your job. I'm saying whatever job you have right now, you got to work your gift at that job. My, this is what I do. I, I can do this all day. Encouraging people is what I do. I promise you. Uber driver, I'm encouraging people. If I was an Uber driver, it's only a matter of time. Hey, tell me, now tell me about your life. So where are you from? What's going on with your life? Oh, okay. If I was delivering pizzas, surprise. I used to be a teller at a bank years ago. I was a teller at a bank. Don't ask me why. I was just trying to make some money. I was a bank teller. I promise you. Y'all not going to believe me. I promise you. My line would be the longest. Because I would be like, oh, this is from, uh, 
House of Freedom, what is this? Well, you know, I'm doing the, the, okay, so you have a business. Okay, now tell me about your life. Now what's happening here? Yeah, I saw you last week. You came in with someone. You didn't come in with this week somebody. You didn't? Oh, it didn't go well. Oh, come on. Just, just put your hand through the thing. Father, we pray right now in the name of Jesus. We just ask that you, I'm telling you the truth. God, we just pray that you would just, all right, God bless you. Here's your money. Praise you. I'm working my gift. I don't see you need a title to do what you do. I don't need a title to do. I got a gift. I know where my gift works. I can be in the gym and operate in this gift. I can put me in Domino's Pizza. I'm going to operate this gift because God gave me a gift. It's mine. See, you complain about your boss. You need to complain about you not working the gift that God gave you. That's the job. But you got the gift. Shoo. You got to learn how to work your gifts. The problem with our generation is everybody wants to stage, but no one wants to go through the stages to get there. If you operate in your gift and develop your gift, you're going to have to take the stairs. Y'all, hear me. I did not start preaching at this level. I started preaching to my action figures. Wow, that was a... Wow. Okay. All right. That's why you got to have confidence, boy. That's why you got to gotta know your gifts. Because the saints. But you got to stick with your gift long enough. Oh, I'm going to get in truck. This is, this is so embarrassing. I'm going to tell you all another embarrassing story. So I've been preaching my whole life. I, I started preaching in Baptist church I was raised in. And when I left that church, left that church around, I was like 22, 23 when I left that church. Started going to the big mega church in my city. And uh, just, 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 it was just great. I was from Boston. And uh, they gave me my first time to preach at the church. Now, I've been preaching at this Baptist church, which is kind of small. Now I'm at this mega church. So now I'm kind of like, all right, I got to. I got to do, I got to do it big, you know. So they just gave me like a prayer morning. It was like a morning prayer. Now, five o'clock in the morning. It's five o'clock in the morning, and they just did prayer. It's like 30 people there, but I'm like, I'm pumped up. I'm suited up, booted up. I'm like, I'm getting ready to preach the house down. First time they're preaching. So I get up there, and uh, I start preaching on the man at the pool of Bethesda. And I said, man, Man, the man at the pool of Bethesda and the Bible, Bible don't even say his name. The Bible says he was invalid. And, uh, you know, invalid means your, your name don't even matter. But, but God says that even though you are invalid, God says that he's still going to bless your name. That God says they may not know you, but he knows you. Because you might be invalid here on earth, but you are somebody on heaven. And God knows you. Come on, somebody. I know nobody knows your name and you feel invalid, but don't worry. God's got you. Can I get a yeah? Can I get a ah? When I was done preaching, my pastor at the time, he came and he said, man, that was great, but that word's not invalid. <laughs> that word is invalid. And I said, oh, oh uh. I mean, I felt the anointing. I felt God when I, let me tell you something, you can be preaching and feel God and be all wrong. I cried. I went in the car and said, it's over. My career is done. Why am I doing this? One of the greatest things that ever happened to me was when he called me again to come preach again. I was shocked because I thought I was done. But what happens is this generation, we abandon our gift too soon. Because it didn't get us the result, or maybe it's not as good as it should be right now. But you got to develop that thing and stay with that thing. And if you keep on staying with it, God's going to work that thing out. Hear me, hear me. Everybody knows the story of David and Goliath. But do you know why David had so much confidence? Do you know why David knew he was going to beat Goliath? He says it there in the scripture. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 34 through 37. It says, but David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it. 
and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair. I struck it and killed it. He said, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. He has killed the, he says, this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. And watch this, the Lord who rescued me when nobody saw me, the Lord who rescued me when I was in the background, where nobody was giving me credit, nobody was applauding me. No, because I saw God with those sheep. The same God who delivered me in private with the sheep is about to deliver me in public with this giant. And I came to preach to somebody who feel like you're in your hidden years. I want to preach to somebody who feel like it ain't happened yet. I came to tell you, don't be ashamed of them sheep. Don't be ashamed of that small business right now. Don't be ashamed because your gift isn't as strong or as big or as loud as you think it should be right now. God is getting ready to show himself strong. And you might be fighting a lion right now, but if you keep on fighting that lion when the giant shows up God's going to remind you of what he did for you when nobody was watching I want to preach to every person who feels like God is not watching. People don't see me. Nobody knows how good I am at this. Nobody knows how much I've been working this. Nobody knows my expertise. I am telling you that your elevation season is going to come. All you got to do is keep on waiting and developing that gift. But what you cannot do is rush into a season you're not prepared for yet. There's a difference between me making a cake and my mother making a cake. When I make a cake, I need, I need a timer. I need a timer because first time I tried to make a cake, my mother told me to preheat the oven. Number one, I don't believe in preheating ovens. That don't make no sense to me. I just did it. She said, preheat the oven. I don't, we don't need to preheat. It's on. Let's do it. I put the cake in. When I see the cake, I'm looking at the golden brown of the cake. And I said, the cake is done. My mother said, that cake's not done. I said, mom, it's brown. It's golden brown. It's, it looks great. It's nice. Mother said, that's not done. I, I said, mom, you know what I'm talking about? I took the cake out, and it looked so beautiful, and it looked great. But as soon as I cut it, the inside. Wasn't done yet. My mother don't need no timer. My mother has the ability to just look at a cake and say, it's done. My mother, because my mother has been cooking so long, she knows not to be distracted by how good it looks on the outside. She knows how to watch it enough to see the signs that the inside is where it needs to be. And the reason why you got to wait on God to elevate you because people are looking at your outside thinking you're ready. So they hyping you up telling you to go. But they don't know that on the inside, you still ain't really been cooked yet. But God says if you wait on me, I'm not fooled by your soup. I'm not fooled by how cute you are. I'm not fooled. God says I see what's going on on the inside. And God says if you wait for me, I will tell you the exact time you are ready to be elevated. And when God takes you out the oven, he ain't going to let you burn I promise he knows when to take you out and when to get a slice of your cake so that everybody knows that he is with you <laughs> David gets anointed king but it's 14 plus years before he becomes king just because you are anointed for something don't mean you are appointed for now <sighs> all right I'm out of here musicians y'all can um um, 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 you know, I, I got, people come to me all the time because we're in a series about church, so sometimes I try to give y'all stuff that, you know, most pastors won't say. Uh, people come to me, right now we're in high school, and people come to me all the time, and uh, they're like, Pastor, you believing for a permanent space? Pastor, we're going to get our own building. And uh, sometimes people come to me and they be like, Pastor, your building's on the way. And, uh, and uh, people ask me, man, do you get excited about a permanent space? And I'm like, yes, I, I do. I want a permanent space. I want us to have a permanent space. But I'm no fool. If we can't get school right, how are we going to get permanent space right? If you're not faithful over another man's space, how are you going to be a ruler in your own space? So some of this is not me trying to, it's not that we're slowing down. It's not, I'm not rushing into something we may not be ready for. Because just because we look good, 
And just because every seat look filled, don't mean we ready for what the responsibility of a permanent space. But I'm telling you, God's working this school. People say, when are you going to live stream? We going? I, I wasn't in a rush to get on live stream because there's some stuff we ain't ready for yet. We take, we, we, we taking a slow route. There, there's some mistakes I'm making that I don't want nobody to see yet. But what's going to happen is as we're faithful in this school, as we keep working the gift God has given us, God's going to watch us for a while. And then I'm telling you, as soon as that cake gets done, God says, I'm getting ready to elevate you. I'm getting ready to explode you. And when that building comes, we're going to be ready for it. Our prayer life's going to be ready. Our worship is going to be ready. Our gifts are going to be ready. Our leadership is going to be ready. Don't let people rush you. All right. Here's my last point. You guys can play. After you discover your gifts, after you develop your gifts, you got to use your gifts. You got to use your gift. I, I don't care where you are in your career. You got to use your gift. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 16, it says that a man's gift will make room for him and bring him before great men. Your gift is going to open up a door for you. See, the world wants you to twerk to open up a door. Yeah, take off your clothes, twerk, and all the doors open for you, just like that. Yeah, man, yeah, yo, man, just get as many women as you can possibly get, man, and I'm telling you, doors going to open for you. Yeah, yeah, man, yeah, yeah, man, try to take every girl out, don't go to TJ Factory. Take every girl out to stake 48. Show them you're a baller. Show them you got it. Because that's going to open doors for you. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if you work your gift. Right? Because we know that in, in principle, we know that in the text, it could be talking about an actual gift that you bring to a king or an actual gift that when you bring a gift to a king. But we know in principle, there's a spiritual principle here, and that spiritual principle is whatever gift God has given you, it's going to open the door. Let me tell you something. If they got you on fries right now at McDonald's, you better work them fries. You better be on there like Friday. <laughs> it's Friday. Put you on burgers, you better say, Watch me flip. Yeah. Watch me, Nanny. Watch me flip, flip. Watch me, watch me, watch me. They put you on that cash register, you better say, Yeah, how you doing? How you doing? Yeah, how you doing? How, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? And then they pick you a manager, you better work that gift. And I'm telling you, you keep working that gift, all of a sudden you're going to own one of those franchise McDonald's. Why? Because you went from the fries to a franchise because you were working every gift at every season of your life. And I am telling you, you got to work the season that you're in right now. Work your gift. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 12. I'm going to prophesy this over your life. It says that the Lord will open the heavens and the storehouse of his bounty to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. I'm declaring over Union Church that God is getting ready to bless the work of your hands. That God is getting ready to bless you with strategy. That God is getting ready to breathe on your gift. Come on, God is getting ready to anoint the gift that you have. That gift you've been overlooking, that gift that you think don't mean nothing, God is about to show you that there's a supernatural anointing and grace on the gift that you have. And I know that nobody's told you it can be monetized, but God's going to show you how to monetize that gift. God is going to show you how to help people with that gift. God's going to show you how to solve people's problems with that gift. God is going to, I'm declaring that gift's going to put you on TV. That, that gift's going to get you on the news. That gift is going to make you go viral. I'm praying it and prophesying it over your life. That gift you have, God is getting ready to anoint it. That gift is going to save this city. That gift is going to be used for great men. I'm declaring that your gifts will no longer be ignored, that your gift will no longer be overlooked, that your gift will no longer be slept on. The city's been sleeping on you, but God says, I'm getting ready to make a table. Good God. And that table you're getting ready to sit at. That gift's going to put you in rooms you never thought you'd be in. That gift's going to usher you into spaces you never thought you'd be in. That gift is about to lead to that promotion. That gift, God, in the name of Jesus, 
You will not have to compromise anymore. You will not have to seek validation anymore. Stop worrying about the coworkers who don't like you. Stop worrying about the businesses competing with you. Stop worrying about the people that are trying to tear you down. I am telling you that God has given you a gift, and that gift cannot be taken from you, and God's going to bless that gift. I need everybody to say amen to that. I need everybody to say amen to that. I want to pray for every person in this room who says, hey, I'm here, but I ain't been using the gifts that God has given me. Because the first gift that I need to receive is the gift of salvation. The Bible calls it a free gift. He says it's a free gift because you don't have to earn it. It is a gift that you can just receive as a result of God, of God, of God, of God, of God, of God sending his only son to die for you. You don't have to jump through any hoops. You don't have to do anything strange. All you got to do is just receive the free gift that God has given you. Can I pray for every person in this room? And can we pray for those who may be giving their life to the Lord right now? Come on, let's just pray. Say, Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for me. I give my life to you. I surrender my will. I surrender my plans over to you. Come into my heart. Save me now. I believe Jesus is Lord. I believe he's risen from the dead. And I believe he's alive today. And now I am saved. In Jesus' name, let everybody say, let everybody say.